Chapter 9 The morning sun greeted the produce vendors in the Byward Market with the promise of a warm September morning. Beneath a powder-blue sky they prepared for another hectic day of commerce. The sweet aroma of freshly baked bread and hot croissants from the French bakery filled the air. A driver unloaded the overflowing baskets of the Ottawa Valley's autumn bounty. Butternut squash, beets, pumpkins, and Brussels sprouts. A block away, Adina winced at the first rays of sunlight streaming into her bedroom. She peered dimly at the light through flaking mascara as she slowly awakened. Thank God it's Saturday, she thought, closing her eyes, only to immediately register excruciating pain in her head. The pounding pressure behind both eyes stretched from her temples and ran deep into her skull. She massaged her forehead, seeking relief as a familiar line from a Bruce Springsteen song surfaced through the pain. A freight train running through the middle of my head. Jesus! Adina cried. She lay in bed staring at the ceiling, images of her dream flashing through her mind. Something felt strange on her left hand. She reached over and touched the diamond ring on her finger. She raised her hand to take a look and then winced, remembering the pain she saw seared across Philip's face last night. She had hurt him with her ambivalence. Ambivalence? Try cruel bitch. Why couldn't she say yes to a man who adored her? Yes to the man who promised to love her always, a guy that wanted to build a life together. But no, she couldn't give him an answer. He had left angry and hurt, with the ring still on her ungrateful finger. She closed her eyes, but even that set her forehead throbbing. Adina finally dragged herself from bed, her head pounding like a jackhammer on steel. She swallowed two extra-strength ibuprofen tablets with water, closing her eyes as they slid down her throat. After the pain eased a bit, her mind wandered to the dream she experienced after Philip left, but it didn't make sense and she couldn't explain it. But she had again gone to another place in another time and once again became another woman, Catherine Carnegie. She opened her eyes and looked around the apartment, back at her life as Dina Stewart. Her mind felt like it wanted to run in a dozen different painful directions. God, she needed coffee. By the time she had nursed down a large mug of strong, dark roast, the freight train in her head had run its course, leaving only a dull ache behind. She noticed the Duncan cello, carefully standing in the corner. This is Catherine's cello, she thought. Adina relived the performance, remembering the words she sung so effortlessly, so powerfully. She recalled the textures of the sound filling the ancient hall and the faces of the men and women who watched her perform. How was it possible? Was it really her? Her words? Her voice? She looked once more at the cello and suddenly thought of Tara. Adina looked at the clock and realized she better get it back to the gallery before Michael, the young security Casanova, finished his shift at nine this morning. Adina took another long sip of coffee, staring out the window, and thought more about how she would get the Duncan cello back to the gallery. Good thing Michael was such a sweet kid. He was clearly taken with her, and if she just happened to fuel his imagination with her innocent flirtations, who was she really hurting? She noticed her iPhone on the table and thought of her own grandmother. Of all the people on earth, perhaps only she would understand. But Margaret Rose was gone. She felt very alone and wished that her parents were here with her. She picked up the phone and touched her dad's face on her favorites list. She hoped he would pick up. Even if he and Mom were so far away, she waited as the circuits connected across five time zones to Scotland. Hi, Pumpkin. Her dad's familiar voice finally greeted her. She could almost feel his arms wrapping around her. Hi, Dad. How are you doing over there? I really miss you, both of you. We miss you, too, he responded. It's been a rough couple of days. I wish you were here. He paused for a second and then added, Is everything okay, Adina? She felt a flood of despair welling up inside her. She fought not to dissolve into tears. Every word that popped into her head seemed useless, incomplete. Her dad must have sensed something because he broke the long silence by changing the topic. We have been thinking about you. How did your audition go yesterday? Any news? Her father asked with a tone of parental optimism. Adina had almost forgotten about the audition. She closed her eyes for a second hoping to exercise the sadness that seemed to possess her over her grandmother's passing. Her dad sounded so hopeful, so proud of her. I got it, Dad. 
she said, forcing herself to try and sound cheerful. Mr. Lang offered me a position with the NAC Orchestra, said I might even get to do a solo. Oh, Adina, we're so happy for you. You deserve it, he gushed. So you played that music we sent to you on your cello. Adina reflected on the question. I did, she said after a moment. But actually, I used the Duncan cello from the gallery at work. She paused again, considering how much she should tell him. Dad, there is something special about that instrument and about the music Grandma sent me. Adina choked a little on the word Grandma, but she felt an overwhelming need to tell someone about her dreams. Something special? You mean about the music or the cello? Her father asked. Well, both, actually. It's almost like they know each other, Adina said, her voice trailing off. And there's something else, too. She hesitated, remembering Philip's reaction to her story. I had the most intense dream. Afterwards. Her father didn't respond. He was quiet, and she wondered if he heard what she had said. Dream, he finally offered. Yeah, Dad, almost like a story you would tell me, she said, choosing her words carefully. I was playing the Duncan cello, but as another woman. She was from the past, I think. Really? Who was this woman? Catherine. I became this Lady Catherine Carnegie in my dreams, she replied, wishing she could see the reaction on his face. And I was singing really powerfully. I, or Catherine, maybe, was singing words that I had been thinking about for a long time, and she stopped wondering how crazy she must sound. And what? Her father asked gently. Adina? She hesitated, unsure how much to say. And she said doubtfully, thinking this must sound so silly. I was in a castle performing for Catherine's brother George, and another brother, um, Sir James? I think he is a captain. Sir James Carnegie? He asked. I guess, I don't know, maybe. She replied, closing her eyes, thinking back. It all felt so real. I've never had a dream like that where I can remember every little detail. Her voice dropped into a frightened whisper. Dad, I don't know what's going on. I had that dream twice. Both times I was playing as Catherine, but for different people. I think I might be losing it. She stopped and felt tears beginning to roll down her cheeks. Her dad was quiet. He must have sensed she was crying. Take a deep breath, pumpkin. You're okay, he said in a comforting tone. Start at the beginning and tell me everything you can remember about your dreams. William hung up after his call with Adina. He stood frozen for a moment. Jackie, puzzled by the long silence, glanced up from the sink where she was drying dishes to see William staring into the distance, lost in thought. They had just finished lunch at his mother's cottage, where they were working on getting Margaret Rose's things packed up and putting her affairs in order. What on earth was all that about? Jackie inquired, having listened to one side of a very peculiar conversation. Thank God Adina finally got that stupid conductor to give her a spot with the orchestra. But what did she say happened after? I didn't get that part. William pursed his lips, still puzzled by everything he had just heard. Yup, she got the job all right with the NAC orchestra. Thank God she worked so hard for it. She did, and I'm so happy for her, Jackie agreed, putting the last of the glasses and cups away. But what was all that stuff about dreaming and singing, and did I hear something about soldiers or a captain? William hesitated for a few seconds before responding. Remember the score we sent to Adina last week, just before Mum died? Had to arrange an overnight courier? Well, after she played it for the NAC conductor, Lang, I guess she had a couple of very vivid dreams. Vivid dreams? Really? More than one? I think so. It was after she played the score. And oh, by the way, she used the Duncan cello. You know the one I was telling you about? The one from over here in Scotland. His wife nodded, looking more perplexed. Yeah, so what about it? So she says that after she played that music on the cello, she dreamed she became Catherine Carnegie. She played for Catherine's brother George and for Sir James Carnegie and... William suddenly stopped and bit his lip, staring at his wife blankly. And what? Jackie demanded. The diary. You know the one Mum took from Canard? He muttered, getting up from the sofa. His mind was racing. Didn't he mention something about a brother? Wasn't it George? He looked over at her, wide-eyed now. Did you see it, the diary? There's something on Mum's nightstand, 
Jackie replied. You said we had to take it back to Canard, remember? William hurried into the bedroom and found the leather-bound diary sitting on the nightstand. He opened it, trying to find the passage his mother had made him read to her in the library at the castle. Jackie stood in the bedroom doorway, staring at him as he thumbed through the pages. What was that date? he said. I think it was August 16. Or wait, here it is. 6 August 1745. He slowly read the entire passage. He raced across the words in disbelief. He whistled to himself. Wow, he said quietly. Oh, my God. What? What is it? Jackie demanded. You better listen to this, he said, adjusting his glasses and reading to his wife directly from the diary. Canard, 6 August 1745. Canard will soon be mine. Arrangements now in progress are going well. Tonight I returned from my glorious days in Flanders with the officers in my regiment, and we were welcomed by my brother George, who arranged a feast of mutton, pies, and ale, along with musical merriment. You see, it was George, he said, looking up at Jackie. Yeah, okay, keep going, she replied impatiently. Arrogant Sister Catherine traveled from Aberdeen to play for me on a new violoncello from Maestro Duncan of Upper Kirkgate that George was able to secure through his merchant associates. Jackie interrupted. The Duncan cello? I think it might be, but wait, William responded. It gets better. But that she, a woman, and mine own sister, too, would play an instrument so clearly in the domain of men was scandalous and altogether unacceptable. Catherine's insolence was intolerable. She told me that I could not forbid her from doing anything. She is sadly mistaken in her naivete. William looked at Jackie. Was she thinking the same thing as him? Would you keep reading, please? Sorry, he said, looking down again at the diary, continuing his narration. Even worse, the song Catherine played this eve seemed to intoxicate my officers. She used their reaction against me. For though it was indeed miraculous, it also the most seditious song ever heard, and played on such a lewd instrument, too. Catherine said it was a composition that she herself wrote, and she could perform it wherever and whenever she pleased. She performed and sang as though possessed by spirits that talked directly of the Jacobite traitors and their young pretender. We had sharp society afterwards, and her hot temper served no useful design. Her delirium was evident when she used her foul Aberdeen dialect, calling me a jerk-off, possibly a Jacobite curse of some sort. Jackie smiled at this, but her face was contorted in confusion. William paused a moment. Keep going, she implored. When I warned her never to perform the cantata again, lest it embolden the traitors amongst us who would destroy the Union, she refused. In her fury, she inquired if I was King Kong, a line of royalty I am ignorant of, but I believe this was meant as an insult to my person. I forbade her from ever playing the instrument again and to find something more suitable for a lady, a cittern. I had her score confiscated and placed it in my keep, where it will remain and cause no more harm to the preservation of the Union. King Kong? Jackie repeated, looking over William's shoulder at the diary. Let me see that. 